Hi, everyone. My name is Kate. Hi, I'm Evelyn. And you're listening to Artwise. I love our music. I just, I want to apologize in advance. Uh, If anyone can hear the motorcycle behind me revving right outside my window, there is literally nothing I can do about it. (laughs) So I did want to bring that up before we get started in the episode. Hopefully it doesn't continue throughout the whole episode, but it's literally right outside my window and there's nothing I can do about it. But anyway, any, any who today with me, I have Evelyn. She's a writer, a, a published author, a poet, all the all that kind of stuff. Um, but uh, why don't you go ahead and just introduce yourself and and talk more about your experience? As yeah, a sure. Writer. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Evelyn Barry. I'm a trans Southern author, editor, and educator. Uh, so I'm the author of the forthcoming book, Grief Slut, as well as a poetry chapbook called Buggery, which came out in 2020. I write primarily poetry, but I've also published a novel, a young adult novel, and some essays and book reviews. Um, So the novel I'm working on right now kind of explores transness in the rural South. Outside of my writing life, I'm an educator. So I run an education program at a museum where I design and teach science and social studies programs. And that education kind of goes over into my creative writing too. So I teach workshops and make educational content about creative writing so that people um, can deepen their experience with craft and also pursue literary publishing. That is amazing. I'm, I was so excited when you applied to be on the podcast because I think we've been TikTok mutuals for a while. Correct me if I'm wrong. I'm pretty sure we have, but we've never actually talked really but i see i see your, your videos come up on my free for you page um from time to time so i'm i'm super excited about that and also uh it's very seldom that we get writers on this podcast i would love to see more of it uh so if you're listening to this and you're a writer please apply because i i love uh, i would love to have a more diverse range of of artists on this podcast and it's it's just rare that i see writers apply. It's usually visual artists mostly. But that being said, I, I did want to ask you, I ask everybody this, what's your your origin story? Like how how did you like how did you journey? That's what I was gonna say, but that doesn't make sense. How did you start your journey? That's better. Into becoming a published author and how, like what drew you to uh writing in general? Like a lot of authors, I fell in love with reading and books before I wanted to write books. And I think that, you know, any kind of art can do this where it makes you feel intensely changed. Um, It might make you feel safe. It might make you re-examine your relationship to the world. Like certainly stories have done that for me. And so from a pretty young age, I wanted to do that. I started writing stories around the time I was 11. I actually have kind of an interesting story about this. So a lot of those original stories were basically just like ripping off already existing books. So I remember the very first like novel I wrote, which was like maybe 200 pages, um, was just a rip off of a series of unfortunate events. And I remember showing it to my fifth grade teacher and she's like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. I'm going to read it to the class. And so every week, if like we worked good on Friday afternoon, she would read like a chapter of my book. And I was like literally like writing a chapter and and then, you know, she would read it. And it was really cool because like, it, it was like, I have an audience, you know, and my, you know, friends would be like, what's going to happen next? I'm like, you're going to have to wait to find out. And we, you know, started bringing in the chapters early and kind of disseminating them on the playground and things like that. And I was just super serious. Like, I was delusional is the thing as a kid. Like I was like, I'm going to be a published writer by the time I'm 13. Cause that seemed really old, you know, when I was a kid. <laughs> and I was writing and, you know, printing out these books and making little booklets to give to people. And I actually started to like query agents when I was that young. 
And it was wild because I just kept writing like new books and new manuscripts. And I think I wrote about five or six like full length novels. Like these were not good, but they were complete that I revised them. And I went through the submission process like in middle school and high school. And so by the time I was like 18 or so, I think I had this like pretty interesting advantage over my peers because when you're a writer or again any kind of artist you have to go through like a lot of failure and i think that you need to go through a period of intense delusion and grandeur about what your career is going to be otherwise it can be really easy to give up but i was a kid so no matter what i did people were like you're a genius right because you're a kid writing stuff and so yeah it's 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 kind of wild I think I got my first poem published first. And I, like I had been published in like the school literary magazines, but the first poem it, like won some like teen poetry writing contest. And I think I got third place. I didn't win actually. I got third place and they gave me $75. And I remember being like, oh my gosh, I can make money from doing this. All right. Um, have I been paid since? Only a little bit. Not, you know, $75 for a poem. Great. Um, but yeah, I was really serious about submitting my work. And by the time I graduated high school, I had a first draft of what would eventually be my first young adult novel. Um, I kept revising it and got a book deal around the time I was like a sophomore. Um, so it was really around all that time. I was like publishing some short stories and literary magazines and doing that. At the same time, my like poetry career was kind of taking off. So I started out pretty firmly in the world of slam poetry and spoken word poetry. And in college was starting to send out my work to literary magazines. Um, so around the same time, I was like a senior in college, like the whole book process is a, is a lot. So it took many years. Um, so I was 22 by the time I actually uh, got the book like out in the world and was published through the small press. And at the same time, I was starting to get my work picked up by magazines and journals and things like that. And you know, I, I, I still, you know, I think was taking myself very seriously as a writer um, and and failing a lot. Like, I kind of think of that first book as a failure. It's it's not any good. But, like, now that I'm kind of removed from it, that was about um, almost seven years ago that it came out. Now that I'm removed from it, I feel, like, really proud of my little, you know, 18-year-old, 19-year-old self. Like, what was I doing sending my work to publishers? And I just was, like, a fearless little kid uh, who really believed, like, I'm going to be a famous writer one day. And, um, yeah, I mean, I'm not a famous writer, but I am a writer and get to, like, um, write and get invited to read. And that's that's been really wonderful. I can see my boyfriend walking to the door from the window, so... Mm -hmm. This was at eight minutes. I'm going to write it down. <laughs> it was perfectly timed. You're good. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, I, I just want to say your story of how you got started is just so inspirational. I relate to so much of mm. what you were saying, especially about like having almost like a delusional sense of confidence. I feel like as creatives, uh, especially like when you find your passion like that so young, I feel like I, I definitely relate to that. I actually, it's so funny because I, I definitely went down a very drastically different path than you, but I used to like write, I wrote a novel when I was 11 too. <laughs> it was, it was so, uh, I wish I could like remember it. I broke the laptop that I wrote it on and I lost all of it. But I do know it was about like a group of kids who found like a portal in the woods and they like kept going back and forth through it. And it was actually like kind of a really cool idea. I wish I still had it, but I, I broke the laptop that I wrote it on. But I I used to really enjoy writing a lot. I always wanted to to write. So it's really inspirational to hear someone who actually saw it through <laughs> and like kept going. I think. It's it's so interesting because a lot of people, like for me anyway, I think part of my issue is I find that I like just so many, so many things. So like I, you know, I did writing probably like elementary school age. And then once I hit middle school, I realized that I was 
better at drawing than I was writing. And so I kind of switched because I was like, oh, people like this more because you know how like, like you were saying, like when you're a child, people praise you like, like, even if you're not great, just because you're so young, they're like, oh, wow, like this is decent. And you're a baby. Like, (laughs) they get so like blown away. And I felt like I had a more positive reaction from visual art than I did writing. And so I I just kind of switched and I stopped writing for a long time until I was an adult. I didn't pick it back up again. And now, you know, I I don't know if I ever see myself like publishing anything I write, but it's also it's like a great outlet and a great coping mechanism and all the things that I'm sure uh, you'll agree with. So uh, thank you for, for sharing how you got started, because it's that's really, really awesome. And it really shows like a lot of work ethic to be able to do stuff like that, especially like from such a young age and to also continue it into adulthood is just amazing. Um, so I did, I, I did want to ask you, how, how do you navigate the intersections of art and poetry in your work? How do you approach marketing your poetry specifically to a wider audience? What are some things that you do to kind of promote it? <clears throat> yeah. I want to start by kind of talking about marketing in general. So Mm -hmm. I want to share uh, a hot take with you, which is that I I talk to artists and creative people. And I I think this is really, really common among poets in particular, but all kinds of artists will kind of balk at the idea of marketing. They think of it as something that's dirty. They think of Mm -hmm. it as something that's like not pure art. And I think it's, you know, or they think it's like, well, like, I'm, you know, I'm just like, down to earth, like, I don't take myself that seriously, like, you have to be full of yourself to to market your work. But in my opinion, it's actually really arrogant to believe that you would not market your own work. You know, like, think about it, like, Beyonce markets her work. When she has a concert and an album, she is marketing her work. Do you think you're better than Beyonce? You know, you have to ask yourself that. So uh, that's a kind of the first, uh, you know, kind of little hill I want to die on. Um, is that like, you know, if you are creating art or writing poems or making videos, you, you know, there is a version of you, like you had said, that it, it, it can be therapeutic, like the process itself can be therapeutic. But at the end of the day, you hope that it's also helpful to other people, whether as an instruction or to delight them and entertain them in some way, or to, you know, I I think a lot of poetry and books are trying to change people's lives and change their hearts and change their minds. And we should take that responsibility seriously. If you're not sharing your work or telling people about your work, you're kind of depriving people the opportunity to actually engage with it. So let's talk about poetry. Poetry is kind of interesting because there are very different worlds of poetry. Um, Some people come to poetry through like the university system, which can be really wonderful, though sometimes those institutions silo themselves from the rest of the community. Uh, There are also um, poets who like share their work on Instagram, for example, and kind of reach a wider audience there. Um, But, you know, there's actually kind of a similar problem where sometimes those poets get to a certain level where they wouldn't really engage with other poets. They're like, here's my work and it's going to live on its own. And I think that for most writers, we should embrace just how beautiful and creative an opportunity marketing is. You know, marketing is an additional opportunity to be creative with your work. So if you publish your work in a journal and it's going to come out in a book, which is like something I'm doing right now, I have a book coming out, Grief Slut, plug, 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 coming out 2024, Sundress Publications. You want to be creative about how you share that work. So you could just share it on Twitter and say, hey, I published a poem, which a lot of people do. But I want to always take it one step further. You know, I'm going to be on TikTok and I'm going to be making videos of me reading my work. Anytime I do a live reading, I'm going to be making like videotaping myself, editing those videos and putting them on TikTok and YouTube. 
anytime I have a poem come out, I don't just say, hey, I have a poem come out, go read it. I say, hey, I have a poem come out, go read it. And then I read the work and then I talk about the work. I talk the background of the work. I talk about the journal that published the work. Sometimes I talk about the different drafts of the work. Um, there are so many opportunities to bring up your work again and again when you have that kind of online audience. And you can also start taking it, like, I think, like, I am at the end of the day, like a literary poet, right? I publish my work in literary journals, etc. But I have this amazing opportunity to go into different fields. Like I started out as a spoken word poet, so I know how to read my poetry well out loud. So I can go to a spoken word slam event and, you know, read a Sestina and have people actually <laughs> engage with it. And that's like, I'm like, yeah, actually, Sistinas are really cool. Check out, you know, the sonnet, the Sistina, the Pantum. You know, we're rocking here with like poetic forms and poetic craft. And I love that. And the same, the same thing is true of like Instagram. Like why can't, you know, prestigious or quote unquote literary page poets share their work on Instagram, right? It's totally possible. And and we can do it in a creative way by incorporating it with art. So like that's something I've been doing, for example, is making like videos. You can make poetry music videos. You can just do an incredible um, amount of things to translate your already existing work to make sure that people experience it. Because at the end of the day, it's cool that you've written a poem. It's cool that you've published a poem wherever it might be published. But I think we should be striving to actually get people to read with and engage with our work because that's when the work of art happens, right? When people are engaging with the work. And um, that's why, I, I don't know, I'm very serious about marketing but for that reason. I, I think it's way more creative and way more interesting than people give it credit for, right? The creation is only half of the process. And the other process is making sure that this creation that you poured love and determination and craft into actually is appreciated by people, right? Yeah, that's amazing. I 100% I agree with everything that you said. I know so many artists, even artists who come on this podcast, sometimes they'll say, oh, like, no one cares. Like, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to post about my work. I don't want to market it in any way. And it just, it's so, it's crazy to me because we live in a, in a day and age where anybody can like, just go off. Like any, any video that you post can just go viral out of nowhere. And like, there's no really like, I know a lot of people think, oh, it's like the algorithm, like there is a formula behind it. But I've had videos do well that like I just posted thinking like, I don't know, like this is dumb and funny, like whatever. And I wasn't ever expecting them to like pop off the way they did, but they did. And another thing that you said that I do want to bring up is how creative marketing can be and how it can be an art form in and of itself. I feel like so many creatives get so caught up in like sharing their work they don't think about how they're sharing it I see so many artists who are so incredibly talented posting you know just like pictures of their work on like a carousel post and like that's it but the people who I have noticed do really well are the ones who get really creative with it and maybe they'll do like a voiceover talking about the meaning behind the work or explaining like why they did something a certain way like it's not just like uh here consume this <clears throat> consume it <laughs> it's it's like oh no like this is actually really important to me like i'm an artist i'm a creative this means a lot to me um here it is this is why i did this this way this is what this means and people i think receive it um a lot differently a lot more positively than <laughs> It's here, look at my art, please. Like, shove it in in their face without any rhyme or reason, or without any like. This is, you know, why I made this. It's just like, no, look, is it good? Do you like it? I made this. It's like, you know, it's it's an opportunity, and I know it's frustrating too for a lot of creatives and a lot of artists who I've had on this podcast who come on here and they get frustrated <laughs> that you know the art that they're having like a hard time like promoting it or that it's like not being received in the way that they want it want it to be received because they think oh when i become a full-time 
artist, author, singer, musician, writer, whatever, when I, when I take that full time, like I just want to spend all my time making whatever I'm making. And I don't want to have to learn all of these separate skills. Cause something that I feel like is kind of ne- neglected in these conversations is the fact that like, when we choose these types of career paths, we're not just agreeing to be a poet or an artist or an illustrator or a painter. We're agreeing to wear like 10 different hats. We're agreeing to be our own marketing team, our own salesman, our own there's like a million things. I couldn't even list them all, even if I yeah, wanted can I to. Can say something about that? Yeah, absolutely. You, know, you mentioned earlier that, you know, you had wanted to be a writer at one point and was like mm-hmm. writing and stuff. I think it's really important as creative people that we don't allow ourselves to make our niche our only focus in life. By yes. which I mean, like, it's good It's good to have a niche, right? It's saying, like, I make pet portraits. That's what I do. That's awesome. But, like, if you learn graphic design, if you, even, even something as simple as using Canva, it's really easy these days. Photoshop, like, you don't need to know all the fancy stuff. On top of that, you can learn Photoshop. You don't even have to go to art school. You just, like, look on YouTube and learn literally anything or whatever free Photoshop alternative you can get. You know what I mean? And that's so cool. Like, I love that stuff. Like, I'm not a graphic designer. I'm not a videographer. I'm not a cinematographer. But I love art. I love film. I love graphic design. I, you know? So, like, it's a way for me to be able to play in a medium that I don't have. And I think this goes both ways. Like poets ignore visual arts and it drives me wild because like a lot of poets who are not so good, I won't name names, have been really successful pairing their work with artwork. And it's wild to me that more poets have not looked at that and said like, duh, I could just do that. You know what I mean? It's wild. And, you know, same with like... um artists as well like you know i i see at least like on like instagram and stuff you know what what has started to really take off and get shared is is pairing you know words and lettering with art right with something that's like a little significant and you can share that little phrase or that idiom or that little piece of advice but it's a in a beautiful setting of that artwork um so it just it opens up a really cool opportunity yeah I I completely uh I completely agree. I think that a lot of like the whole niching down thing, everybody talks about it all the time and you know, it's it's fine in in some regard. I mean, I get like when you are the person to go to for that specific thing, it's really easy to become the biggest fish in that pond. So I understand the concept of niching down, but also as a creative, it it almost hinders you and like when I when I said, you know, I, I write all the time now as an adult, when I was really trying to get good at, at visual art and uh, I primarily uh, graphic design, I didn't write at all. And I remember this is, <laughs> this is kind of a funny story. I went to a a psychic. I used to work at a custom t-shirt shop. I was a graphic designer there and it was right next door to this metaphysical shop. And one day my manager's wife was always in that store and she was like, you got to come in there with me and get a reading. And I was like, okay. So I got a a reading from this, this woman and oh my goodness. She was like, are you a writer? And I was like, no. And she was like, you're gonna be. And I was like, okay. And she was like, you don't write. And I was like, I used to. And she was like, oh, like this is going to be really big for you, but like you, it's not going to be in the way you think. And I'm like, can you give me any more details? And she was like, no. And I was like, okay. And it's funny because at the time I was so focused on getting better at design. I didn't want to be a, you know, a custom t-shirt shop forever. So I was like, you know, even when I had like the urge to write or the urge to paint or the urge to illustrate, I said, nope, I got to focus on my graphic design. I got to focus on my typography. I got to focus on learning these things right now, because if I even though I have this urge to write or to paint or to draw or to do these other things, like this is what I really need to focus on to get good at now. And it really caused like some bad art block within me. (laughs) And I think like not, not a lot of artists 
talk about that. But when, when you're a creative human being, like, even if like, I don't consider myself to be like a writer, but I love to write. And if I prevent myself from doing that, when I feel the urge to write, it causes creative blocks in other places. Like as a designer who I, I mostly do like brand design and strategy now, I will have blocks in those places if I keep myself from creative expression in other ways. So if I ever wake up one morning and I say, you know, I feel like I need to paint today, I just have to let myself paint. Because if I don't, it's going to cause blockages in my creativity as a whole. And I think not a lot of artists talk about that because it's really easy to get caught up in the whole, I have to niche down. I have to focus on the thing that I really want to be like a master at. I have to focus on like these specific things. And, you know, I honestly, one day, like maybe I won't be a graphic designer. Maybe, I don't know, maybe my illustrations will, I'll start to focus on that. I just like, I'm not really, I kind of put myself in the position where I feel like I am the niche and I know that the people that follow me and the people that listen to this podcast uh, are so supportive of me. And I honestly, you know, I made this podcast for fun and to help people. And I don't get paid for making this podcast at all, but I still do it because I'm passionate about it and I love it so much. And it's another additional creative outlet for me. And it really makes me think like I kind of am building my own niche in that sense. Like I am the niche. I'm Kate Merriman. There's not really another one like me. So this is my niche and I can do whatever I want now. So I I feel like if more artists thought that way and set themselves up to be the niche and stopped kind of having like limiting mindsets around, oh, I don't want to learn marketing. I don't want to learn sales. Tying it back to what we were talking about earlier, I I feel like it would be a lot more beneficial, not only to like their craft but also like just mental health in general when you stop yourself from doing things that you feel called to do it just it causes a lot of inner turmoil and conflict that just isn't necessary (laughs) yeah that makes me think of um when i was a teenager i got really into making youtube videos uh with Mm. my brother and we do like skits and stuff and this was like I it what I think of is like the golden age of YouTube, right? It's like between like 2008 and 2011, right? Um, yeah. So these were like all like these OG YouTube, and I was like, that's what I want to do. And I had a terrible camera, like I used my mom's camera. It would spend like six hours uploading, you know, the files to the family computer, where I had like a free video editing software to make these skits and I love making them you know maybe one video got like a hundred views and that's all I ever got right and what was cool about that is you know years later you have these platforms like TikTok and you know Instagram Reels where I don't even think of my ability to make videos. I'm like fast at it. I'm like, okay, I can script a video. I know how to, you know, do an angle in a video. I know about lighting. I learned all of this stuff, right? And it's not what I do for a living, but it's fun. You know, that's that's the thing about these kind of extra creative endeavors is that it doesn't need to feel like a slog. And I, and I know it sometimes can, but yet, like you said, like, it's a fun thing. Like if you're feeling a little slow or uh, like you're not moving forward as much on a creative project, like your ability to step back and work on something else creative and a completely different medium that still advances your career, it is actually a, a real gift. Yeah, I, I definitely, I wish more people would see it that way too. Because I, I know so many people especially I have a lot of friends who went to art school and a lot of people who either went to art school or even some people who ended up in corporate design like me I I hated working in corporate I don't think I could ever go back to that kind of setting just because of how restrictive it was and I feel like ultimately when you're an artist and you're making anything that is like kind of one of the ultimate goals at least for me anyways is is like freedom the freedom to make anything it's just it's overwhelming but it's it's beautiful in a lot of ways so speaking about making things 
I was wondering if you could share some of the creative projects that you've been involved in uh, to bring poetry into public spaces and how those came about. Yeah, I kind of stumbled into this through collaboration and friends. Uh, doing public poetry programming and projects, I think helps expose people who would otherwise never read a poem to poetry, right? Uh, like that's one of my goals is that like, I, I hope that my work speaks to people who don't read poetry, which sounds like a wild thing, but like that's, I feel like I get that all the time where like I'm the only poet they read, which is cool <laughs> in a way, you know, they're like, I thought poetry was boring until I read your work. I'm like, that's exactly what I'm going for. So. Public poetry projects in general seek to put poetry in unexpected places. And I think you could do this in a lot of different ways. It could be big and it can be small. So like an example of a really big project, um, which I did not take part in, was at the O Miami Festival, right? Where they actually made poems that were painted across several rooftops so that when you descended in your plane to the Miami airport, you would be reading a poem, right? Or just finding it somewhere unexpected. Um, a couple of years ago, I did a project with um, the Wine and Food Festival in Charleston, South Carolina, which is this massive event. And as part of this event, they have what's called the Culinary Village, where you can go and just eat and get really drunk. And I got to take some of my poems about food and Charleston food culture and drinking culture and local artists in Charleston transform those poems into murals, right? So it was a collaborative project in order to share poetry and art together, right? In a really cool way. Um, so I've been involved with a lot of stuff. So I'm gonna just kind of talk about some projects. If you're listening to this and you're like, I wanna do this, I encourage you to basically just copy what has been done before, because that's how it's done, right? You hear a cool idea, you make it your own. So a lot of the projects I've been involved with were in collaboration with Free Verse Festival, which is the Charleston Poetry Festival, which is run by my friend and my mentor, basically, Marcus Hamaker. So he's done some really cool stuff. Uh, one of the things he did that stood out to me was called the Words in Windows Project, where he took poems and actually printed them in the windows of cafes and restaurants. And the poems were about food, and that also the project was a way to fund um, food banks in food deserts. So, you know, you can actually connect, right, the public poetry project to the actual place where you're engaging with the topic to also a cause that the, like, act of making poetry and art might actually have a real material effect in the world. Um, they also did like projects where they would make tags for bikes. They would write poems in the spaces between the stripes of crosswalks, right? So, you know, you're just crossing the street drunk on a Friday night and suddenly you're reading a poem, you're engaging with a poem. Um, a couple years ago, uh, Free Verse did a collaboration with uh, this poetry artist duo called Saint Flashlight called the Lost Poems Project. Um, and there's been similar ones like that where, you know, there would be actual posters like stapled to phone poles and places like that where you could call a number and hear a poet read their work. More recently, I've been doing stuff in Columbia, South Carolina, uh, in collaboration with the Columbia Poet Laureate. So a lot of this stuff I, I didn't personally organize, but I've been involved in, and I'm very happy to have my work involved in it. So um, three recent projects. Every year for the past few years, we've taken poems and put them on the city buses. So it's something you can read while you're on the bus. Recently, too, one of my poems was used in a kind of brochure at a local hospital, right? So it'd be kind of like the little trifle brochure that you pick up to read about, okay, what is this uh, particular uh, part of the hospital all about? And in the back, there would be one or two poems that would hopefully help you reflect on healing and maybe deal with something really emotional that you were going through. Um, and similarly, I think a similar poem, I think I edited it a little bit, was used last year in the Prescription Poetry Project. So we had printed out um, poems and we put them with people's prescriptions at some local pharmacies. Um, and then my absolute favorite project and also the most recent, um, which was cool because it just featured uh, my work. 
I worked with a local student at USC, which is our local college, University of South Carolina, to do what's called the Trans Poems and Trans Spaces Project. So I wrote a series of poems uh, reflecting on being a trans person in the South. And they printed them, they designed these really cool designs, and then they disseminated them in trans-affirming spaces. So, for example, therapy offices where someone might be going to to seek um, advice about gender transition. Uh, also, like the clothes exchange room at the local college where people can go and get gender from clothing. Um, recently, I saw, a, you know, I went to a trans support group and on the LGBTQ center, just like on the billboard, there's one of my poems, right? It's crazy. Not my billboard, but you know, the notice board, bulletin board. So it's been really cool to just encounter poems like that, right? It feels a lot like the subversion of going into a bathroom um, and reading something that is like actually really <laughs> meaningful to you. And you're like, wow, bathroom poet, bathroom philosopher, you really speak to my soul. Um, that same kind of concept, but kind of put into all of these different forms. Wow, that's that's incredible. So you did, you talked about kind of like working with students. So you're a, a creative writing educator as well. Can you just talk a little bit about your your background educating as an educator in the creative writing space? And um, also, can you touch on some of the most important lessons that you aim to teach your students in regards to writing? Yeah. The reason I became an educator and started doing education work in kind of non-traditional ways is because it was something I was always looking for as a young writer. I was the type of kid who'd be like reading author interviews online constantly. Anytime a writer came to the library, I was there to, to listen. And by the time I was in college, I didn't study English um, and I never got an MFA in creative writing. And what you start to notice is that there are certain things either on a craft level or within the publishing and art industry that are only accessible to people who pay money to get degrees from these certain institutions, right? There are professional norms, for example, in publishing that are really important that you would not know unless you got an MFA. Uh, there are also, you know, styles and ideas that you might not get exposed to unless you get an MFA. And there is also just terminology, right? When you're talking about poetic craft or we're talking about certain poetic forms or a literary device that to understand them, can help deepen your relationship to reading and writing. So my purpose in, in being an educator has always been to make sure that people without institutional access to this kind of knowledge know that it's possible to find that information and to make it easy to find that information, right? To make that those resources free and readily available, like similar to what you're doing in your podcast here, right? Anyone can download it and just listen. And when you're an artist or a writer just starting out, that ability to be able to hear the lessons of other writers and hear them talk is invaluable. So, you know, I want to be kind of clear, like, I am not a creative writing teacher at a school. The closest I've, you know, gotten to that is like being a summer camp instructor. And once I was an artist in residence at a local elementary school for about a year where I did an after school creative writing program. But my kind of, you know, career outside of writing is as an educator. I run an educational program. I'm not in the classroom every single day, uh, usually in the museum, uh, doing tours and educational programs, going and doing programs. And then uh, a lot of my education work is just for free because like of that idea of wanting to um, make sure people have access, especially young writers, you know, who I, I I think about myself, like I was so serious, you know, I really wanted that access to that kind of information. Like, how do I get published? How do I navigate all of this stuff? What are the deeper parts of craft? So I have worked um, with a lot of youth, for example, I began working as a coach for a youth poetry slam around the time I was at college. And then I've done similar to like the artist in residence program, a couple of different workshop series at different institutions, like uh, different like, community poetry workshop programs. 
I also used to run an arts nonprofit in Charleston, South Carolina, where in addition to open mics and poetry slams and all this other stuff, we would have free workshops for everyone and writing groups and things like that. And it's wild because like, you know, people write their entire lives, but they may not have heard of certain ideas. And, you know, my, my kind of advice for people who are learning, right? They're, they're taking seriously, like, I want to learn about this stuff, is that I know that, especially in writing, learning about craft and kind of getting into that nitty gritty can seem elitist, right? Because it's usually people with really advanced degrees using words that are confusing, right? That are not that difficult concepts, but they are confusing words because people do not know the words, right? And, you know, that can feel really alienating for a writer. It says like, well, I'm not a real writer because I don't know what Cesora is, or, you know, I, I don't, I can't define objective correlative, but you probably know what that is if I showed you. And you said, oh, I know exactly what you're talking about. Like there's, you know, words and writing where we use a big word and like what we really mean is repetition, right? <laughs> Stuff like that. So what I want to do is help people expand their vocabulary and also get access to all those resources because they're out there, right? But they're hard to find, like whether it's a podcast, it's a website, it's, you know, certain books that you can buy, right? You're not going to have to spend $40,000, but you might be able to spend $15, right, to get a book or get it from your local library. Shout out to the libraries to expand your own relationship to craft. So. I still do this now, like um, I've been doing a program called Poets in Schools, where I will go and visit schools. And I, I still mostly do youth workshops for free. With adults, it's a, usually I try to do it at like conferences and things like that, or for organizations like the um, Writers Association, which is kind of an unaffiliated association of writers who are all kind of helping each other out. Um, and then lately, this is a good chance for me to plug like what I do online. Um, I'm Evelyn Berry writer at TikTok and YouTube. I have over 100 videos helping people understand craft. And, uh, you know, again, the purpose of that is so that people who want to deepen their relationship to their own work and to the work of others can have that more fulfilling relationship. Yeah, I I definitely relate to a lot of what you said um, in in regards a lot a lot to this podcast um, just because I I'm not like a teacher really by any means but an educator not really that doesn't really fit either but the whole you know like I like you were saying the whole purpose of this podcast is to provide a free resource for people to be able to learn and I'm not usually the one doing the teaching it's usually the guests on the podcast but. I wanted to um, provide that platform because um, when I started my business, and this podcast is kind of an extension of my business, one of my key values is education and having it be, you know, uh, like you were saying, easily accessible and a big inspiration. I think uh, you can relate to this too, was my, my younger self. And, you know, there were a lot of things that I really wanted to do when I was younger that I felt like I couldn't do because I didn't have access to the information that I needed, or I didn't have access to these professionals who've already been, you know, down the road that I wanted to go on. The closest thing I had was my dad, who's also a graphic designer. And so I feel like that's kind of how I fell down the same sort of path. So it's really it's amazing to hear somebody with, you know, similar goals to making education in kind of their area of expertise, like super accessible. I definitely want to be one of those people as well, <laughs> hopefully in the future. Right. But I did, I did want to ask too. So these questions don't tie together very well at all. Maybe it's the order I wrote them in. I don't know, but this is kind of, it's not random. It kind of, relates to what we're talking about. But I did want to ask uh, about your approach 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 to indie publishing um, and what advice uh, you would give to aspiring writers who are considering self-publishing their work because I have a few, I think I wrote like just for fun, 
you know, I wrote, I think I have two full books, like completely written. And I've thought about like, no one's ever read them. Like not a single soul on earth has read them. But I always like think like, huh, Amazon KDP, like I could just publish this and not tell anyone like so easily. I could just publish it and not tell anyone and no one would probably ever read it, but it would exist. Like I think about that all the time. So I was wondering what, what advice and what, what you would say to aspiring writers considering self-publishing. <laughs> yeah, sure. Okay, I have a lot to say on this. First of all, I'll say that I've had a variety of publishing experiences. So I've had um, chat books that I've self-published. I publish with small presses, and I've also been kind of traditionally published. There is a lot more to publishing than people generally think. People think of like traditional publishing versus self-publishing, but there's a lot in the middle. And um, I think that no matter where you are, you just wanna take yourself seriously. I think that um, I personally really dig self-published authors. Like, you know what I mean? Like I, that, that's like been a, you know, I kind of explained earlier, like I get to exist in a lot of different worlds. So like I've self-published my work. I also, you know, done panels with like big time writers. I can kind of be across these different avenues, right, of publishing. Um, so I think that, uh, so first thing I want to explain is the term indie publishing is a little tricky because more recently, like on TikTok and stuff, when you talk about indie publishing, people are talking about self-publishing. But traditionally, that's not what that means. Indie publishing usually refers to being published by a press that is not one of the major five presses. So there's five no. major corporate publishers, and there's also what are called independent publishers, under which most books are published, right? And it's really a question of attention and a question of resources. So the difference is, you know, getting Penguin Random House to publish you, you're going to get access to an incredible marketing team, an incredible distribution network to get your books into bookstores all over the place, right? The downside of that is that you have about one week to make it or else you get thrown to the side, right? At the end of the day, you're still having to do a lot of that marketing and focus yourself. It's rare that you get so much attention from that kind of press. Indie presses have a much less um, powerful network, right? A dissemination. They might be able to get you into some indie bookstores, but not others. You know, they can probably get into Barnes and Nobles, but not others, right? Your book will most likely not be on the front caps of bookstores, right? You need a big publisher to muscle in with their money in order to make that happen, right? I don't know if people know this, but like people pay to get their books in certain places in bookstores. It's This is, you know, a big, big money thing. But at the same time, no matter what level you're at, whether it's a big publisher, a small publisher, or you're doing it yourself, you should be serious about writing and also actually marketing the work. Um, so this is what I mean by that. Kind of kind of all across the board, people really rush into it. People want it to just be quicker than it is. And unfortunately, it's not quick. It's a long process, especially revision. You know, people will come and say, hey, I wrote a book. Oh, fantastic. And they say, well, yeah, I just finished it. I just hit the end. And now how do I publish it? And I, you know, kind of look at them and I'm like, oh, Girl, like it's gonna be like five more years before you do something with it, you know, because like you gotta go through that revision process. You gotta you gotta sit with it. And you don't have to do that. Like you can throw things up on Amazon and, and publish it. And then it becomes a question of like luck. But like it doesn't have to be if you put like craft and effort into the marketing and creation of it. The the other thing with self-publishing that you have to realize is that you do not have that dissemination network behind you, right? Your work may not be appearing in bookstores across the United States. It is actually really hard even to get an independent small bookstore to carry your book. You know, maybe your hometown bookstore will allow you to. Some will not. So how do you find readers, right? You need to then like hit the ground running, like, you know, get on TikTok, get on Instagram, and you need to do this way before you publish a book. Right? You need to have, have already built that audience um, for the book. You know, even, even with major publishers, po like people don't sell books, especially, I mean, poetry is awful, right? 
to sell like a hundred books of poetry is like a success, right? Some people don't sell a hundred books, right? Um, to sell a thousand books of poetry is in the poetry world like a runaway success. Like that's incredible. To sell something like 10,000 books is the top of the top, right? Because it's a very small niche. It's a little different with novels, but even then, like a lot of people don't sell more than say 300 books over the lifetime of their books. And yeah, I mean, I know I keep harping about marketing, but like, yeah, you know, if you put into that work or in the case of self-publishing, you probably put money behind that book, right? To print it um, and to send it off to people. Like you should also be um, putting time and effort into marketing it. Um, And and I, I think it's just important, no matter where you are, not to rush the process. And so one final thing about self-publishing I will say is that there there are a lot of different ways to do self-publishing. I think that you should not allow yourself to feel intimidated by the publishing industry because I think what happens is that you will like as a self-published author come up against people who are like, well, you know, I have this press and I have this press. Like, who's your agent? You know what I mean? And these are kind of questions kind of like to knock you down, to make you feel small. And I think it's really important to know that at the end of the day, publishing is just people doing things. They're sending emails. So if you as a self-published author can make yourself look professional, if you can um, either hire or become a good graphic designer, if you know how to learn how to do page layout, if you wanna like really revise and make that work tight and amazing, then you can make something that when the reader reads it, like, you know, if I were to sit here and name off indie publishing companies, I'm like, oh, have you heard of Grey Wolf Press? Have you heard of Copper Canyon, Pre- Copper Canyon Press? If you were a poet, like, you're like, oh my God, yeah, those are the most famous presses in the world. If you ask some random person, they're going to be like, I don't know what you're talking about. They don't even know the names of the big publishers, right? So like, why does it even matter? Like you can literally on Amazon, if you like publish your work, you can make up a name for your own press. You'd be like, yeah, I was published under naked mole rat press you know what i mean and people are like all right whatever you can make your own logo and print it on the spine of the book and it looks pretty legit and so you know we're all making it up all publishing companies are is that 200 years ago someone and their friends got together and said we should publish our friends books and they kept publishing their friends books and then other people said hey you're pretty cool want to publish my book and people kept publishing books and now we're 200 years later and they're well-known publishers right um, you can do that. <laughs> you know what I mean? You can do that with your friends. Um, recently, I, w- I will tell you one more story about self-publishing. So the very first chat book that I self-published, a chat book is like the EP of the poetry world, right? Before you put out the full length, you put out a, a chat book. They're little tiny books. And I put out a chat book called Glitter Husk. It's no longer in print. It's sold out, which is great because uh, it was kind of a limited edition thing. And um you know, the very first thing I ever published was, was sorry, I'm getting way off track. Okay. The very first thing I ever published, 19, I self-published a chat book called Skinny Dipping the Strangers, right? And I just did it all myself. I, you know, literally laid it out myself in Microsoft Word. Uh, we took the photographs for the front cover. We did the book design. I don't even remember how I did that, but yeah, I, you're going to laugh at this, but yeah, I did Microsoft Word book design. It was not good. <laughs> but yeah, like we, we made it happen, right? And then a couple of years later, um, I self-published another chat book. It was called Glitter Husk. Um, and it was pretty successful. And one of the reasons it was successful, because I had already like built an audience. Um, and so instead of sending it off to a publisher and waiting through that process, I did pre-orders through like Indiegogo. And said, like, if you want a book, you can pre-order it early, and then you can pay extra money for extra perks. So things like tickets to a special exclusive party. Also, like, for, like, $50, you could get, like, a one-on-one session with me to do, like, poetry critiques, which, like, some people did, right? And we we raised, like, I think, like, $2,500 to publish this book, which was enough to um, hire a professional layout editor, hire a professional graphic designer who made uh, and, a, and an artist as well who made an awesome front cover and then another graphic designer who made like the text and glitter and it just looked incredible and to also like go to a, a real press and get it um, published through them because 
I'm a little anti Amazon, to be honest. Uh, so you could also do this yourself. Like if you have friends who have a printing press, like, like you can print a zine right off your printer at home and staple that shit. And I do that all the time. <laughs> like, you know, like I, I make these little like limited edition zines for my friends or for like certain shows and things like that. So all of this is just to say is like, you can do it yourself. You can do so much stuff yourself if you are willing to, to do the work. And, and you have to, I think, have a little bit of confidence in yourself and your work that you're not going to allow yourself to be talked down to or seen lesser as because of the mode of publishing. Because as we move more and more into the 21st century, publishing is going to continue to change and we need to be versatile. And I, you know, I encourage, like, I love indie presses, which is why like, I like that middle of the road, small press. I can still be super creative, have a lot of say over the art decisions about my own book, but without going into like the corporate world of publishing. Yeah, that's really interesting. I've, I never really, I have, so I don't know if you heard this episode at all, but I think the only other writer that we've had on this podcast was Mona Ray and her episode was the second episode of season two. Um, I don't know what the number of the episode was, but she, I think she ended up doing self-publishing in the end. I think she ended up self-publishing because she was trying to go through uh, larger publishers for a while. And then I think she just said, you know what, never mind. I'm just going to like publish it. And I read her book and it was amazing, by the way, for anyone who hasn't read it. But I I think about that a lot because it does seem like such a complicated process. And I also I do follow a lot of uh, children's book illustrators as well. And that is like a whole other process to kind of it's it's crazy to me because I follow their their name is uh, the Cuttlefish Academy. Kaz Kaz is like the main person on that account. And they're always like posting like these crazy stories about like, oh, it's actually like incredibly difficult. Like you're going to get a hundred no's before you get a yes. But once you get a yes, like you're in, like your foot's in the door and you're in. And I, you know, I've never really experienced that, that world of like publishing before. Um, but I would, I would like to learn as much as possible because I just think it's so cool. <laughs> we are coming up on an hour though, and I did want to give you the opportunity to read a couple poems before we do your self promo and hop off. So if you wanted to go ahead and do that now, I feel like it's the perfect time. <laughs> yeah, I would love to do that. And shout out to Cuttlefish Academy episode of Artwise when uh, I hope I need to reach out. Was I was that, just I, I, Yeah. Yeah, you should. I I've listened to most of your episodes on my end, so no worries. I'm oh, familiar. yeah, amazing. No, yeah, I do <laughs> That's why I was like, I knew about it. I was like, all right, I'm about to be on this podcast. All right, <laughs> this is a poem. <clears throat> this is sorry. You're good. <laughs> this is a poem called "Queer Ecology." Don't be surprised. I'm a redneck wussy. Moonshine sloppy with a limp wrist. Town crier sobbing on the street corner. You'll get used to the lipstick. Same like the scuppadine's flesh sweep pulp. I'm here. Sure as roadkill. Sure as oh possum. Night slicks slurping blood ticks. I'm everywhere. Like a dandelion falling apart in the wind's embrace. I'm haunting the family tree. Same as you. Born to this ecology, this bloodied patch of dirt. Go ahead, spit me roadside like a boiled peanut shell sucked of salt. Crown me queen of the chitlin strut. Don't be surprised, the ground's so fertile. Young queer has been fucking in the fields since the first sin, first garden delight, first Adam's apple taken in the mouth, first seed spilled if you bury enough wild queers in the dirt, one's sure to sprout in your backyard. I, I, I wish I could clap better when I wear a brace. <laughs> that was so incredible. I have chills. Do we, are, are you doing two? 
Can we do one I'll more? Do... Yeah, sure. I would love to. I want to read the opening second one. poem of my book. This yes. title might get changed because we're about to do the editing process for this manuscript. But I wrote this poem because a lot of trans people have terrible relationships with their past selves and their dead names. And I want to cultivate a kind of relationship of love and care for my past self. And so this is a poem called Praise Song in lieu of obituary. Bless the sprigs of coarse hair sprouting from your nipples. Bless the tenor in your chest, cajoling song from cement mixer. Bless your burlap skin. Bless the razor scraped across your chin, bruised stubble. Bless it all, this body that has carried you. Bless even what you'd rather abandon. Bless this sugar-wrecked relic. Rust-feathered myth in your blood. Bless you, bouquet of bruise and belly fat. Bless your body, prelude to a corpse. Prologue to whatever comes next. Bless the boy born here. Bless your body for holding your body long enough to imagine a future. Derek, silly. Sweet Derek, bless your body, not because it is beautiful, but because it is yours. Wow, that's incredible. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. I, you got to do like an audio book where you just read all of the poems. I I, I might, we'll see. I'll be you a conversation do it. <laughs> with the publisher. We'll figure it out. That would be so cool. I I love that so much. Thank you so much for sharing. I appreciate it so much. I do want to give you a second also to to do your self promo, and then we can go ahead and and like wrap up the episode. But um, anything that you want to promote, uh, keep in mind it's currently February, but this episode is coming out like towards the end of June. So whatever around June <laughs> could potentially be going on, um, promote all of it. The floor is yours. <laughs> Yeah, if you want to check out my work, whether it's my books or my poetry or anything at all, you can find it at evelynberrywriter.com. I also encourage you, um, if you want to get my book, pre-order Grief Slut from Sundress Publications. And if you can't wait for that, you can order Buggery, which is the chat book. Hopefully, uh, I'm like almost out of that book. There was only a couple, you know, 300 printed, and we are nearing that number. So um, get it soon. <laughs> it might only have a couple left. And if you like have listened to this episode and you want to learn more about craft, or if you just want to see videos of me reading my work more, <gasps> ooh. Or me dancing to TikTok songs. You can follow me on TikTok and Instagram, Evelyn Barry Writer. And uh, finally, if you want to see me scream into the void, if this platform is still in existence in June 2024, you can follow me on Twitter at EV underscore writer. You can also follow me on Facebook if you're, you know, a Gen Xer or a baby boomer. That's also totally fine. I have a healthy boomer audience, which I love. I love you all. My beautiful old friends. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Awesome. Thank you so much, Evelyn, for coming on. I appreciate you being vulnerable with me and telling your story. I am so excited for this episode to come out. And thank you to everybody who listened this far. I appreciate all of you. If you want to support the podcast, as always, all of the links, Evelyn's support links and the podcast support links will be in the episode description wherever you're listening. Um, so please check those out. And um, as always, I will see all of you guys again next Tuesday. Bye, everyone.